Welcome to the Brad Lang Show. I am Brad Lang. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about something the left can't seem to stop talking about. Loopholes. Closing the gun show loophole. The gun show loophole. The outrageous loophole. Loophole. The loophole. The gun show loophole. We Who aren't allowed on a plane shouldn't be allowed to buy a gun. Closing the online loophole. Dangerous loophole. If you're on that no-fly list, your access to the right to bear arms is canceled because you're not part of the American family. Loopholes. Those sneaky little ways of getting around laws that you don't like. Every time in this country that we have a mass shooting, there is going to be a line of politicians who want to get behind a podium and tell you how they're going to do everything in their power to stop this tragedy from happening again. Except they're lying to you. Actually, they're pandering. It's, it's slightly different. Politicians. They get up there and they say that they're going to close these loopholes. Now, we have three main loopholes today. The gun show loophole, the online loophole, and the terror watch list loophole. How that can be. So, what you have when they come out and they, they try and tell you that the gun show loophole needs to be closed. They're saying that everyone should have a background check and that these gun shows are like the Wild West where any murderer or psychopath or terrorist can show up with a handful of cash, walk out with an AK-47, a bunch of magazines strapped to their chest, head on down to the mall, shoot the whole place up, and grab a soft pretzel on the way out. Except it's not true. At a gun show, you have vendors. Now... These vendors are all local shop owners. Most of them actually have brick and mortar stores that you can go to. In order to be in that business, you're required to have a federal firearms license. It's an FFL. And as a part of that FFL, your transactions are required to be accompanied with an NICS background check. So most of the people that you will find at a gun show are required by law already to run a background check on you. You can't just go out, beg them, and say, hey, you know, crowd's kind of dying down. If I give you an extra 500 bucks, why don't you give me that AK? It doesn't work that way. Now, there are private sales, which is a whole separate issue. That's something that's, that's mandated by state statute. Some states allow it, some states don't. To what degree they permit it varies by state, except in white. Oming, who's the only state who seems to really get it. There is one small requirement when you're doing a private sale, is that the seller has to believe that the person is eligible to buy a firearm. As long as they believe that they are eligible to buy it, then there's nothing, there's no repercussions on that seller because they haven't broken any laws. And if that's what you want to deal with, let's have that conversation. Do I think that private sales is kind of a gray area, especially the way it's handled by states? Yeah, I do. Do I know what should be done about it? Probably not much. Because the fact of the matter is, is that over 40% of weapons used in criminal cases are not even purchased that way. As easy as that might sound. Most of them are stolen or traded for drugs. There's no statistical proof that ties gun shows or private sales to increased gun violence. And especially since if you buy it at a gun show, you're probably getting a background check. Hence, no gun show loophole. The next one is a, is a more recent one. The internet is a fantastic place. You can find anything from uh, bath bombs at Walmart to this video right here. Um, one of the things that's become very large is you can now buy firearms online. It's not really a, a new thing, but it's taken the forefront in that, in that argument against guns. The left likes to make you think that well, now I don't need cash, and I don't need to go to the gun show. I can just log on to any old website, www.murderweapons.com, pop in a Visa card, and they'll ship it right to my goddamn door. Again, this isn't true. Now, I have a concealed carry permit in the state that I live. 
this is a Kimber Solo 9mm. And since this is YouTube and there's plenty of you out there who are going to say, well, you didn't clear the gun. How do you know it's not loaded? Well, it's because I'm responsible and I know it's not loaded. Kimber Solo 9mm. When these came out, they were almost impossible to find, but I really wanted one. So, I found a gentleman in Alaska. Alaska. It's pretty far away. He had one that he was looking to sell. We agreed on a price. I sent him the funds. That's how capitalism works. That is also a lesson for another video. After he received the funds, he took this dangerous Kimber Solo. It's so cute. Look at these round edges. It has a laser. Hmm. He took this down to a gun dealer, an FFL licensed gun dealer. That dealer then contacted my dealer. That's, I have a dealer. You should have a dealer. If you have some of these, you should have a dealer. They exchanged paperwork, shipped this from Alaska to my guy. Once this came in, I went down there and I filled out some paperwork. Did I get to grab this and walk out the door and go to the park and watch pigeons eat bread and shit on everything? No. I had to fill out all the paperwork just as I had bought the weapon from that store itself. And because he's a licensed, an FFL licensed dealer, I went through the NICS background check system. So anything that is bought online and shipped across state borders has to be shipped to an FFL dealer, which means there is a background check involved there as well. So that's two loopholes that aren't really loopholes. They both feed back into the same thing that they never talk about anyway, which is the, the private sale. Can something be done about it? I don't know. I don't really care. The problem with it is that there's so few guns that get used in crimes that are required by any of these means. The last one is the terror watch list or the no fly list loophole. Now this one is especially nefarious. It's not because there's not a thing there to, to, to battle against. It's not like a loophole where they claim, hey, this is something, uh, look at this, but we really want to do all these things. There is a no-fly list. There is a, a terror watch list. And in the post-9-11 era, we've all kind of accepted that that's the way it's going to be. I don't like it, but that's how it is. The problem with it is you cannot allow the government to set the precedent of denying a citizen a constitutionally protected right, not even necessarily just the Second Amendment, any of your enumerated rights. If the government can then take them back just because they put you on a list, doesn't that seem like a sticky slope? If you're going to take away somebody's constitutionally protected rights, you have to go through the judicial process and give them a fair trial. Give them a hearing as to why this is being denied. That's why we don't allow guns to felons because they've been found to be irresponsible and incapable of owning a firearm because they're a threat to themselves or society. There's nothing in the terror watch list that says, well, these people are a threat, an imminent threat to themselves or to society they just have the wrong name. Maybe it sounds funny. I mean, Ted Kennedy was on the no-fly list. That sounds funny, doesn't it? The no-fly list is a terrible mechanism. And don't ever let them try and scare you into using it as a tool. In Connecticut, the governor tried to get the FBI to give him the no-fly list so he could do it himself. I mean, there's some people out there willing to go to some really extreme measures just to deny you the right to bear arms which is kind of scary. The last thing I want to talk about, I've only read about this a couple of weeks ago, and of course it's in California. The thing they want to do is they want to close what they call the hate gap. Now, gaps, loopholes, I don't really know which sounds better when it plays on the nightly news, but that's what they've gone with. The idea behind that is that if you have been convicted of a hate crime, you cannot own a firearm in the state of California. This is super, super tricky. The problem here 
most hate crimes, if you are convicted of them, aside from the ones that are tied to larger crimes that are felonies, like murder, uh, they're misdemeanors. It's, it's, it's hate speech or, or, or nonviolent offenses. They're, they're going to start putting roadblocks in at, at lower and lower thresholds to try to take guns away. And whenever they come out and they say, well, we just want common sense gun reform, or we just want sensible regulations on these guns, nothing they propose is ever common sense or sensible. Most of what they propose is utter bullshit nonsense that they come up there to talk about just because it placates most of the people watching them. This isn't going to stop. There's going to be more loopholes, more gaps, more little ways that they are going to come after guns. These people don't even understand how a gun works. I remember not too long ago seeing the videos of, of a reporter firing an AR-15 for the first time, giving PTSD, and he almost went deaf. A little secret, my wife's favorite gun is the AR-15 because it's easy to shoot. So... I guess my wife is really tough because she just kicked the shit out of a six foot three reporter. You should be informed. It's important to know. And whenever somebody tries to tell you that we need to close this loophole or close that loophole, just know that they're full of shit. To stay up to date on all the latest content and videos, be sure to click subscribe. And you can find me on Twitter at Brad Lang Show. Thanks for watching.